This episode of Mike Plays RP1 will see us bringing life forms to greater heights than ever before. First, Evelyn Wolf will crack the 25 kilometer crude altitude record in the inaugural flight of the X2 rocket plane, a feat that will unlock more options in the administrative building. As well, some admittedly simpler life forms will be crossing the Kármán line and, hopefully, returning safely to the surface. And finally, the date has arrived for my second V2 launch, only for me to discover that my software and hardware engineers weren't exactly on the same page. Let's get started. Starting off, we have the final launch of 1952 and the fifth and likely last launch of the XASR-1. First launched in Episode 5, this rocket has been a workhorse for me over the previous year, collecting high atmosphere and near space science. This flight saw the completion of the telemetry data in near space. Though there is still lots of temperature and pressure data to collect up here, last episode's unlocking of the post-war material science tech node allows me to upgrade my fuel tanks from steel to aluminum. So after this mission was completed, I went back into the VAB to perform the upgrade. What's great is that you don't have to redesign the whole rocket. Simply right click on the tank and change it from high pressure steel to high pressure aluminum. You will immediately get some more utilization as the thinner aluminum allows more volume to be used for propellant. The change of the tank also requires you to refill it again. The extra fuel and mass reductions results in an immediate delta V boost, but the extra fuel increased the burn time to 55 seconds while the engine is only rated for 40 seconds, so I decreased the length of the tank until the burn time was 48.3 seconds. You want to have a little extra fuel as there are always residual propellants left over after the engine flames out. Don't hesitate to play around in simulation mode to optimize this. This being a new tank, you will get the option to tool it. I want to try to go over the details of tooling a little better than I have in the past. You can see here that the cost of tooling the tank is 785 funds, and tooling will bring down the cost of the part from 69 funds to just 6, a 63 fund savings with each launch. This may not seem like such a great deal, but there is another factor to consider. If you press and hold preview fully tooled integration time and cost, you can see the effect that tooling has on the integration time. In this instance, it knocks 22 days off the time it takes for the engineers to push out this rocket. To me, this is well worth the cost of tooling, so I clicked Tool All. So it's not just the cost, but also the time savings that need to be considered when tooling. Anyway, I saved these edits dubbing the new vessel the XASR-1 Number 2. Though a little later in this video I decided it was a little bit too wordy and just made it the XASR-2. It was then into the hangar to do the same with the X-1 rocket plane. As before, I also took advantage of the extra fuel volume in the tank and increased the utilization. But I also wanted to make this plane more capable than its predecessor that was featured in the previous episode. So I increased the length of the fuel tank so that it can fly for a longer time, decreasing the length of the structural fuselage behind the tank to keep the plane from getting too long. Of course, I continued to pay close attention to aerodynamics. As well as looking at Ferrum's stability derivatives, I paid more attention to just how the vessel felt as it was flying. The X-1 always felt nose heavy, so I moved the wings forward to bring the center of lift much closer to the center of mass, way closer than I'm used to in stock. During testing, I was paying particular attention to how much the atmosphere autopilot had to pitch up in order to maintain a level flight. But before long, I got the plane to be able to accomplish what I wanted. And you will be seeing what I have in mind a little later in this video when I fly what I've now dubbed the X-2. Anyway, once I was happy, I tooled the new parts, knocking over 100 days off the integration time. 
The extra fuel did have a couple of spillover effects. I had previously performed my air launch 150 kilometers from the space center, but this distance now had me well overshooting the runway, so I'll be increasing the flight distance to 200 kilometers. Second, I wanted to reapply the chute settings to this vessel's new dry mass, and finally, the extra resources this plane requires forced me to renovate the hangar, though those renovations are only going to take three days. But before the X-2 was going to be ready to fly, the V-2 number 2 was rolling out at Launch Complex 2. Well, at least I thought it was my second V-2. Alright, I'm scared. <laughs> it's been too long since I built this. Okay, um, let's... Oh, why did it not boot? That's a good question. See, I'm already a little nervous. Maybe I forgot to put the boot file in there. I might have. Okay, switch to zero uh, list. There should be an a V2 number two. Okay, so hopefully everything's going to work because it's been so long. <laughs> so run uh, V2 number two period go. Unfortunately, my initial trepidation was well founded. This isn't going to get to altitude. And I've. What the happy F? I got me a feeling this is still V2 number one. That somehow got saved. Ah! Just so people realize, this is definitely not an engine failure. On the upside, I do have recorded evidence of me constructing this rocket and can investigate exactly what happened. The original V-2 completed the first low space film return contract, which required it to reach an altitude of 100 kilometers and a downrange distance of 200 kilometers, taking photographs and returning them to the surface. This improved version was designed to perform the next contract in the program, this time reaching 150 kilometers in altitude and 400 kilometers downrange. I even wrote a dedicated KOS script for the mission that I was eager to show you. Anyway, here's the short of my investigation. V2 number one was launched at an angle to get the downrange distance I needed, but this time the plan was to have my KOS script handle that, so I straightened up the rocket so it would launch vertically and saved it as V2 number two. This new rocket was going to require some more fuel and, not surprisingly, this larger rocket required a launch complex renovation, but after beginning the renovation, I forgot to save the changes I had just made, and once the renovation was complete, the rocket I gave to my engineers to integrate was simply the straightened up V2 number one I had saved earlier. I suppose it wasn't a total loss, as the rocket did return 1.4 science worth of photographs, but this was definitely a disappointment, as V2 number two was intended to be the focused mission of this episode, especially the more advanced KOS script I had developed. Well, rest assured, I made sure the correct rocket got sent to the engineers after this mission, a rocket that should be the focus of next episode. In the meantime, the upgraded version of the XASR-1 that you saw in the VAB earlier this video was ready for launch. Oh, oh, oh no! Our first launch failure! Why am I excited? <laughs> oh, range safety. Destroy vessel, yes. Boom, okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it had to happen. It had to happen that we got an ignition failure. Okay. I'm, I'm, that's, that's, that's what happens. Okay. Uh, we are going back to the space center. Why am I excited about that? Oh, dear. I know that went by pretty quickly, but I did take advantage of a feature of the avionics packages called range safety, which, well, as you saw, blows up the rocket. 
I only found out about this thanks to some comments on a previous video. In fact, right after this mission I realized that attaching this feature to the abort action group would be a good idea, so I did exactly that with both rockets that I'm currently integrating. Just avoid doing this when there's crew aboard. A bit more time warping saw the unlocking of early tracking systems. This gives me small biological sample capsules to strap to my rockets as well as an upgrade to the science core avionics. This got me a bit excited because there is a contract in the suborbital rocket research program to take a biological sample as well as 35 units of sounding payload up to an altitude of 100 kilometers and return it safely to the surface. This sample capsule is not big, so let's see if I can modify that rocket that just failed so that it can carry it. First, let's upgrade to post-war avionics. Though this costs nothing to unlock, it does double the cost of the part. For that, the mass drops about a third and the power consumption by half. I like how many upgrades there are here. It makes sense that we're going to see continual improvements to the electronics as we progress through the years. There are two almost identical biological sample capsules that I've unlocked. I like the description. This is a capsule containing biological samples, fruit flies, fungus, perhaps a mouse or two. I think I'm going to go with fruit flies, which actually were the first animals to be fired into space. Although some of this data can be transmitted, we'll get more science if it is recovered, which is a contract requirement anyway. I went with the inline one, even though it is a bit wider than my 30 centimeter diameter rocket. If I had thought ahead, I could have made the original WAC Corporal wider from the get go, but at this point, retooling a wider diameter tank will get expensive. Instead, I increased the size of the parachute, which doesn't come with a tooling cost, and the avionics, as it will have to be retooled anyway due to the upgrade I just unlocked. So I just increased the diameter of the base of the cone from 300 millimeters to 375 millimeters. After that, I did a quick simulation reaching an altitude of 152 kilometers, well over the required 100 kilometers. I decided that I was only going to recover the avionics and sample, not the whole rocket. So I inserted a procedural decoupler, which I used to form a transition from the 375 millimeter payload to the 300 millimeter tank. And honestly, I'm rather happy with the look of this. I then reconfigured the parachute for just the mass of the payload, which also saved me a bit of weight. After another simulation to test the parachute, I decided I really liked the little door that opens on the sample capsule. Like the rest of the rocket, I want this to be automated, but rather than changing my KOS script, I decided to employ a smart part, specifically the Alt Pro Altimeter and Action Group Trigger. To remind people, smart parts are not part of the RP-1 package, but they are great for easily adding in simple automations. I initially thought I would need two of these, one to open the door and one to close it, but I soon realized I could do both with one. The sample capsule starts collecting at an altitude of 40 kilometers, so I want the smart part to trigger at that altitude. I put toggling the cover on action group one and then set the smart part to toggle that action group. You can set the trigger to be active only on ascent or descent if you want, but in this case, I need to leave it on all. But what I initially forgot to do was turn on auto reset so that the part will reset after it is first triggered during ascent. I don't like the look of the part on the side of the rocket, so I use the move tool to slide it into the center of the nose cone. This cone is way bigger than it needs to be anyway, so I figure there is plenty of space. In addition, the part does weigh 10 grams. It's not a lot, but moving that mass to the center can't hurt. We'll finish this off with a little bit of tooling and then hand it off to the engineers of Launch Complex 1. As this rocket will be ready before the V2, I paid a visit to Mission Control to cancel the low space film return contract and pick up first low space biological experimentation. In RP-1, there is no penalty for cancelling contracts, so you need not worry about doing so. Now, some of you may be wondering about the 35 units of sounding payload that is also required for this contract. Yeah, at this point I had forgotten all about that, but not to worry, I realize this before the mission is ready for launch. A launch that you'll be seeing in just a little bit.
But first, it is time to get a somewhat more complex biological payload off the ground in the form of Evelyn Wolf aboard the X-2 rocket plane. Off the chop. Oh, so much better than last time. <laughs> and now we can open up this GUI and we want to go to an altitude of 25,500. We want to get to a heading of 270. So let's put that on, let's put that on, let's put that on. And we want to climb angle 15, 15, 15. Calm yourselves. Okay, we're off. This is so much nicer now that I'm starting this off with fly-by wire toggled on. Anyway, I do have an objective here, and that is to achieve a crude altitude record of 25 kilometers. The previous X1 couldn't get much above 20 kilometers, but the changes I've made, specifically the lighter aluminum fuel tank, allows this one to reach higher. I also have the supersonic flight experiment aboard. This experiment requires Evelyn to maintain a speed between 450 and 500 meters per second, but as the mission is about maximizing altitude, she's going to keep the throttle at max, so we won't be spending much time in this speed range. That said, this plane is capable of maintaining that speed if I want, which will definitely be the goal for the next time this vessel flies. Back in episode 4, Evelyn broke the 15 km altitude record in the MiG-15, which unlocked 7 new leaders that, from the names, I presume to be potential flight directors. But that position isn't available until I break the 25 km crewed altitude record. So this mission should not only complete the contract, but should also allow me to hire some new leaders. Oh, oh, yeah, we're getting low on fuel, but I think we're going to get this, so 24? Four and a half, four point eight, point nine, twenty five. There it is. It's green. So there we go. Crude altitude record. Probably a speed record here, really too. Though there's no contract, but I mean, look at that. We're over. Uh, we're gonna be click. Oh my gosh, we're gonna hit seven hundred meters per second. Seven hundred. Let's. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's get this back down. Let's start. See if we put this at five hundred and deploy the flaps a little bit now that I actually have flaps and hopefully uh, there we go Valentina or uh, Valentina Evelyn's having herself a great time and we got to really slow down we're coming over here that's the runway so we really want to lose speed now okay contracts complete we can get rid of that we can lose this now if I open this it says just, uh, yeah, you set an altitude record, but seven reputation, but I'm hoping a little bit more. If I look at, yeah, I did get uh, 19 grams of supersonic flight sampling. Uh, I guess Evelyn opened a window and just kind of scooped in a little bit of air. I, don't, I really don't know <laughs> what that is, but hey, we got the flaps here fully deployed. Pitch is holding. And we're losing altitude and losing speed, which is what we need. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Oh, the flaps are great. I now have the flap on uh, just one setting. I'm down. Oh, I'm actually speeding up at that. Let's put it on two. Oh, I went the wrong way. Two, two, two. There we go. Still want to slow down. I think I actually fully deploy them. I think I need to slow down. It's going to level off at about a 300 meter altitude. I'm eyeballing the runway. Maybe a little more this way. Maybe a little more. Okay, we're leveling off. Uh, let's uh, bring the flaps down or up. I think I'm going to go to stand, fly by wire, so we're off of this, and uh, more flaps, so now it's, now it's me, now it's on me, me and fly by wire, more flaps, unfortunately I was so comfortable gliding in low that my already armed parachute caused a problem. 
Oh shoot, that, that went a little earlier than I thought. I got a little too close to the ground. Because we are slowing down fast now. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. We are coming down. <laughs> okay, that's what quick saves are for. I like the coming as low to the ground as I did. It's just it triggered that parachute. So now I got the parachute. Uh, no, like I disarmed it and then put it in its own state and, and separated in the staging. So now I should be able to come in nice and low like I just did. So it was when I got below 100 meters, I think, that it did that. But I kind of like this, like, nice and low. Okay, I am fully deployed on the flaps. Level off. I'm gonna just wait till I'm actually over the runway up on deploy. Oh, there it goes. And... Brakes. <laughs> okay. Okay, still working on it. Notice the difference in the parachute. I don't think I had a drag chute the last time. Not that it really mattered, but boom, she's down. Okay, so we are going to uh, recover you and get ourselves into the administrative building and see what we... Yes! Oh my gosh. I've unlocked a lot of stuff. Okay, so I do have my flight directors, but I also have contractors. Yep, turned out that this unlocked back when I completed the research on post-war material science. The same tech node that got me the aluminum tanks. And more contractors will be knocking on my door after I research early human spaceflight material science. Well, that's clearly not going to be for a while. In the meantime, I've got some decisions to make. For my flight director, I went with Chris Craft, who gave me a 5% speed bonus on VAB integration, rollout, rollback, and launch complex efficiency at the price of a 5% increase in crew training costs. For my contractors, I chose JPL, Rocketdyne, and McDonnell Aircraft which combined got me a 10% research speed bonus on science, avionics, and electronics, plus 5% research speed on early and orbital rocket engines, and plus 5% integration speed on cockpit parts. This came with a 10% increase in the cost of vessels and launches, and minus 2% on my program funding. It was then back into the VAB as it was at this point that I realized I'm missing the 35 units of sounding payload on the XASR-2. Sounding payload is held in the procedural service module part, which also was unlocked with post-war material science. I set the diameter to 375 millimeters, the same as the rest of the payload. The part is really a tank. You modify the contents through the tank UI. Sounding payload is down at the bottom. I then adjusted the length of the part until it could hold just over 35 units, and then just entered 35 manually. I placed the tank below the biological capsule, and then moved the parachute below that. Of course, the parachute had to be reconfigured for the extra weight, and the service module tooled, but thankfully, no other modifications were required and what was done added less than two days to the integration time, leaving the road clear to launch day. All right, no ignition failure this time. Fruit flies away. All we need now is for the engine to do its full burn. It is a heavily overcast day though. Get out of the clouds and into the sun. Remember that we need to achieve an altitude of 100 kilometers and then recover the payload. Okay, yeah, we're at 137 and change dropping, but it's not going to drop below 100, and that should be our biological sample is now running. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Like, a little door opens up. Like, what are we doing? Are we uh, just, like, exposing these poor mices to, like, the vacuum or something? So we're about to go past a hundred. 
And then that should get this all green. And now all we got to do is return safely. Still going to get to 135 kilometers. So we got more uh, speed. No science stuff though, but we'll get a nice amount of time here in the upper atmosphere. Nothing from telemetry, temperature, or pressure scans. Those are all done. Uh, I considered taking these off. It would have saved me a couple of kilograms and a little bit of cost, but I, I worry that if I take them off, I'll forget to put them back on. Oh, oh. Good job, good job. KOS. KOS has done its job. Still collecting, though. Oh, we're getting some temperature scans. Some temperature scans, I'm assuming, over the water here. Or over the shores. We're close enough to the shores now. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, there we go. It wasn't complete. Oh, that's uh, our booster. You know, probably the fins on the booster, wherever it is. Oh, we're now done, though, with that. So what do we do? What do we do? 3.5, still got 11.3 left. So let's double that 7... 11. Oh, we collected about a quarter. Just shy of a quarter of it. That ain't bad. Actually, it's about 31%, but who's counting? Either way, a few more exposures to the rigors of space travel should net me the rest of this science. In the meantime, the contract was completed once the vessel was recovered. Also knocking on the door is a second flight of the X-2 rocket plane and a second try at that low space film return contract featuring that more involved KOS script. Who knows what those missions will bring, but that's going to have to wait until the next episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you then.